Good evening, everyone. Glad to be back here after uh, Pesach, Passover. And we will continue our series, Psalms. If you remember before Pesach, we, ar we arrived to chapter 45 and we finish it. So all together, we have 150 chapters to do. And now we're going to start with chapter 46. And uh, the summary, short summary of this uh, chapter 46, it's a chapter that's speaking about the confidence of the Jewish nation in Hashem. This confidence always stays still and strong no matter what happened around, what happened in the world, destruction, wars, nature, revolutions, all kinds of things like that, the nation of Israel always aimed to one savior, never to anything else. Can we say it today, the same thing? Yes and no, depend who you ask. You come to the ultra-Orthodox people in a time of problem, in a war, when missiles are falling on Israel, when the, the Palestinian murderers are shooting missiles, you come, you ask the people in Yerushalayim or in Bnei Brak, all the Bachure Yeshivot, who is saving us right now? Their answer would be Hashem. You go in Tel Aviv, you ask them who is saving us right now from destruction, they say the Israeli army. And then, not, again, not that the Israeli army is not doing anything. They do their job. They're defending the nation. But if there was no such thing as Israeli army, let's say, what Hashem would let us die, all of us? So obviously Hashem has to protect us. Now he has different ways. Since there is an army, he used the army. There was no army, he would use a different army. You know, or use something else. There's all kinds of ways that Hashem protected us in the past. Not always we had the army. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't have. When they attacked us in the middle of the desert, Amalek, what army we had? Did we have a professional army with training? There were women and children and men just came out of Egypt, and all of a sudden, massive army with horses and weapons, they all came, and the war started. And what happened? We not only defeated them, but one Jew got hurt. And remember, this was with no technology, no F-16, F no spies, no Mossad, no tanks, none of these things. No United States, no backup plans, no atomic bombs. Very primitive. Hashem wants us to win, we win. Hashem doesn't want us to win, we will never win, no matter how great we are. That's what we all have to understand. In the past, it was, a, you know, ordinary belief. Everyone believed in it. Today, it's already a different question. Some people are so far away from Judaism, so far away from the truth, so far away from Hashem, that it's not even crossing their mind that there is somebody who's watching us from above. It doesn't even occur to them. Some people, they believe in God, but it's not in style to admit where they live. So they pretend they're cool, you know, atheist. It's in style now. But some people, they really don't. They don't really believe. They're not lying. You connect them to a lie detector, they'll tell you, I don't believe that there is a Hashem that helps us at all. If the army won't be good, we'll be destroyed. That's the way they think. Unfortunately, this kind of thoughts making our situation worse. When we all aim and trust Hashem, like the Torah say, when the hands of Moshe are up, all the nation of Israel are up to Shamaim. Right away, we win the war. When the, when the hands are down, that means the eyes are also down. Everybody lose. So what do we see? We see Hashem said, Hashem ilachem lachem, v'atem tachrishun. I'll fight for you. And you be silent and just see the, the miracle that I'm about to do to you. So no matter what destruction the world would have, our fate as the nation of Israel is 100% in the hand of Hashem. And if, you know, everybody would understand that, for sure the situation will get only better. Because there's a concept by Hashem that the more you believe in Him, the more He helps you. The less you believe in Him, the less He helps you. He leaves you in the hand of those you trust. You trust the rich man to feed you, you in His hand. You trust Hashem to feed you, you will find enough people that will help you to do the job. But Hashem will always put you in a good situation. It's all depend if you trust in Him 
or you trust in people, or you trust in fake things. That's a very important concept to remember. So uh, the question is why this Mismor was written. Some say it's, you know, with the plan of all the nations, the ancient nations, to fight the nation of Israel. They say it after the destruction of those enemies. Some say that this Mismor was actually about the destruction of Sancheriv in a time of Hiskiyahu, the king of Judah, 2,600 years ago. And 185,000 of his soldiers overnight, they all died. Hashem made a miracle. They, all of a sudden, they heard the singing of the angels of heaven, when a person cannot hear such thing and stay alive. It's in such a high divine level, it takes the soul out of the body right away. So Hashem revealed the, the singing of the angel, of the, of the Ofanim and the Srafim. This is what we say in the Kedusha when we pray, Kadosh, 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 Va'ofanim, V'chayot HaKodesh, all these creatures, spiritual creatures that Hashem made in heaven. When they sing and praise to Hashem, the music, the singing is in such a high level that a person, even today in this world, there's some great music that you hear, you feel your soul coming out of your body like violin or all kinds of, uh, you know, like it's, it's affecting your mood, it's affecting your soul. You can see right away. We see in the Tanakh that when Shaul was down, he called King da uh, David before he became the king. He called David to play for him and to bring his spirit higher, meaning the music has an immediate effect. This is, by the way, the secret. When the Egyptians were drowning in the Red Sea, and the angels came to sing, Hashem silenced them. He told them, My creation is drowning and you want to sing about it? So what's the problem to sing when the Nazi Egyptians are dying? It's a big celebration, no? When the camps were liberated and the Nazi lost the war, the Jews had the right to sing or no? Of course they had the right to sing. Finally, we got rid of these monsters. So what's the problem? The answer, the Jews, of course, can sing. That's why Moshe sang, Miriam sang, Az Yashir Moshe, the Jews sang. But the angels shouldn't sing. Why? Why the angels shouldn't sing? The angels show Hashem, they love the Jews. Why? Because Hashem loved the Jews. So if Hashem loved the Jews, the angels also love the Jews. Why? The angels are soldiers of Hashem. If the king loves somebody, his, his deputy, also should love him. If he doesn't love him, that means he has a problem with the king. That's how it goes, no? So why Hashem told the angels not to sing? Not like some people think. The answer is really that Hashem said to them, I don't want this Egyptian to die from your song. I want them to die by me, not by you. Why? Ani velo malach. That's what we say in Haggadah. I'm taking you out of Egypt. No angels today. I am doing everything. I take revenge against these Egyptians. Ani, what we say now? Ani, me and not an angel. Me and not Saraf. It's another kind of angel. So therefore, the angel wanted to sing that these Egyptians will hear and die. But Hashem said, I don't want them to, to die by listening to such spiritual music. No. I want them to die measure for measure. They threw my kids, my babies, into the Niles. The babies, the Jewish baby, they threw them into the water. I want them to drown in the water. I don't want them to die in any other way. They must die the same way they killed. That's how it goes. Some one person once gave a speech, and then he read a book, and sent me a book. This is a famous man in Israel. I don't even think he's religious. And if he is, he's very, very light. And he, he investigated the, the death of Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, about 20 years ago. He got killed. How did he get killed? One Jew came and shot him. Even though there's all kinds of conspiracies that the Jew really never killed him, he didn't have real bullets, the, the Secret Service, they are the one who killed him, all kinds of conspiracies. One way or the other, the way it was presented in the media, that Igal Amir shot Yitzhak Rabin. That's how the whole world heard. But the interesting part is, when they came to this Igal Amir, everybody was in shock. I remember those days. We were in the middle of a seminar in New Jersey. I got that news Saturday night. It happened Saturday night, I think. I mean, in Israel. So we got that news when it happened. 
And I remember after that, they asked the murderer, they asked the murderer, do you regret what you did? He said, nah, he was smiling. Not, not only I don't regret, I regret that I didn't kill Shimon Perez also. That's what he answered. 20 years pass by, you may expect that after a person will be isolated in a jail, in 20 years he's sitting in a small cell, no communication to the world, no phone, no internet. He doesn't even walk outside. He's not a sport person. So after 20 years, maybe his spirits will be broken. 20 years later, they interview him a year ago. They ask him, do you regret for what you did? He said, absolutely not. It had to be done. I did the right thing. Yitzhak Rabin was a trader. He gave the Arabs the Jewish land. Somebody had to stop him. That's what he said. Why do I all of a sudden telling you about this story? Because it's all measure for measure in life. This is what this person that wrote the book, he brought it to my attention. He said, it's very interesting. He actually doesn't even know what he said, in my opinion. He said it, but it's much deeper. He said, Yitzhak Rabin, when he was an ambassador to the United States, they asked him here in Washington, your history is not so clean. You were the commander on the beach when the boat Altalena came from Europe with Jewish refugees after the Holocaust. And you shot them and killed 16 of them with your own hands. You killed Jewish people. Don't you regret it? What was his answer? It's in his book, in case you don't believe it. In Yitzhak Rabin wrote it in his book. Instead of hiding it, he's bragging about it. He, he, he said, it's a, the old man gave an order, and, uh, and me as a commander in field had to fulfill the order. I have no regret whatsoever. That was his answer. Instead of saying, I was only the commander, the, the prime minister Ben-Gurion gave me the order, he didn't want to mess with the British that were in control in Israel, there were political reasons for it. Of course I regret. Who wouldn't regret killing his own brothers? But believe me, there was a lot of pressure on us. Something like that, maybe people will have a little sympathy for you after all. Nothing, just with cold blood, he answered, no regret whatsoever. What did Hashem do? You shot, you kill people, another Jew would kill you. You kill Jew, a Jew would kill you, which is very, very rare that a Jew will kill another Jew. Today it's not rare anymore, unfortunately. But 20 years ago it was very rare. Now, Baruch Hashem, unfortunately, what's going on in the world, a lot of Russian mafia came, all kinds of goyim merged into Israel, they imported with them lots of crime, prostitution, drugs are everywhere. Today, everything is possible. But when I was a kid, I told you, when someone in eighth grade smoked a cigarette, everybody in my city already signaled him as a criminal. Why? Because he was smoking a cigarette in eighth grade. You understand how down we went? So this is to give you an idea in one generation how we're sinking fast. But the idea that everything Hashem does is measure for measure. You kill Jews and you don't regret, a Jew would kill you and he won't regret, ever. He doesn't regret. No matter how many times they told him, express regret that you regret and will put you one day, maybe there'll be a chance for you to come out of jail. So no, he will stay in jail forever. He will never say, I'm sorry. Amazing. Usually all, everybody who kills someone else, a minute later he say, what did I do? I don't know what got into my head. I'm so sorry. And definitely in his trial, he's begging for mercy. This, nothing. Until today, never changed his mind. Which we see how it works, measure for measure. One more thing we should know about this, this mismore that uh, it was written by the children of Korach. It was written by the children of Korach. And the children of Korach, you know, they are hinting to the days of Gog and Magog, the final war. What's going to be the final war? Before Mashiach arrive, there will be what we see today in the world. Everything is getting ready for the final stage. And Mashiach would come and take revenge against all the nations, all the anti-Semite nations who tortured the Jewish nation nonstop over history. 
But before Mashiach would arrive, many problems will already occur in the world, with the Arabs and the rest of the world, as the Prophet spoke about. Spoke about. So this Mizmor is speaking about that final war. What is he talking about? It starts, Lam Natseach Livne Korach Al Alamot Shir. What does it mean, Alamot? Alamot, this is a word that has four different meanings. Four different meanings. One word, four different meanings. Where do you find such a thing? The answer is, what are the four, four meanings of this word? One, it's a music instrument. It's music. You play music with that instrument. It's called alamot. Second, it's young ladies. They're teenagers, girls. Third, it comes from the word ne'elamot. Alamot, something like olam. The word world in Hebrew, it's olam. Olam means world. Why the name of the world is olam? It comes from the word ne'elam, mystery, hidden. Everything is hidden. What you see, it's not the truth. You see one picture, but the truth behind it, it's completely different. You see things that look like coincidence. You don't know that Hashem is making shiduchim, sending this guy to this guy, sending this girl to this guy, marriage, this, the, everything, wars, leaders, you know, all these things Hashem pulled the strings, you don't see it. You only see the final results. That's why the world called olam. Also here, alamot means things that are behind or above our understanding. And one more thing, one more thing this uh, Alamot has, it's, it's uh, we said, young ladies, we say, it's also Alei Mavet, Alamot, if you break it to two words, it's someone that is supernatural, above that, which means it can be an angel, it can be anything that you cannot kill, or the soul, so there are four different meanings to this word alamot, which soon we're going to explain, to explain this whole mizmor. So the concept, the, the understanding of this mizmor is that everything is in the hand of Hashem. And when the time comes, the nations themselves will destroy their own weapon. There will be a day in a war that the nations together, unitedly, they will all gather and say, listen, there's no point of keeping the weapon. What's the point? We had all this weapon, but now the world, so many people died. Two thirds of the people of the world would die. So many billions of people are dead. The, the leaders will all gather together and say, listen, we have no reason to keep the weapon anymore. We see that God runs the world. We saw in our own eyes, there's no more, no more doubts. What's the point of keeping all this weapon? The weapon will be destroyed. You may ask, how is the people gonna do such thing? They can say, okay, we will never use our weapon, but they still keep the weapon if something, if one day something would happen. The answer is, which, go, which goim will do it? Only the righteous one, not the wicked one, because the wicked one got wiped out. All the wicked people in the world, Jews and non-Jews, all wiped out already. So the world only have now righteous people, righteous Jews and righteous Gentiles. After the righteous Gentiles saw what Hashem did and how he saved his nation against all odds and how he sent the Messiah and they saw that the Messiah is the Jewish Messiah, not all the nonsense of fairy tales of Christianity and the rest of the cults out there. Everybody saw, and that's what we say in the prayer every day, Bayom Maui Hashem Echad Shmo Echad. Everyone is united under one God. And all the Gentiles that remain in the world will be in love with the Jews. So what else they need a weapon for? They don't need a weapon for. Nobody has desire to fight anymore. This is what the prophets wrote, that the lion and the sheep will live in harmony. Lion and next to the sheep, lion can live next to the sheep. One hour will be dead. But in days of Mashiach, the world will come to such beautiful correction that all the things, all the evilness that you have right now will not remain. That's, you know, of course it's above our, end, our understanding, but if we have a drop, a drop of idea what's going to happen, it's better than nothing. 
So let's uh, translate the words of this Mizmor, and then we move on to number 47. So now Mizmor, chapter 46. Lam Natsach Livne Korach. The Natsach, as I said, is conductor, is in charge of the orchestra to the song that was written by the children of Korach. Which children of Korach? The children of Korach, that second before they drowned and died with their father, they made tshuva. They made repentance, and they survived. They almost died, but they made tshuva in the last minute. So they survived, and now they are busy writing singings to praise Hashem. So, by playing this instrument called Alamot, Elohim lanu machsev haoz, Hashem is our shelter and strength. Ezra betzarot nimtza meod, He always around next to us to help us in time of tragedy, tragedies and problems. Al ken lo nira be'amir aretz. That's why we will not be afraid when the earth will be destroyed. When the earth will be destroyed, in a time of Gog and Magog. There will be a disaster in the whole world. When this time will come, this is a prophecy. This whole Mizmor is a prophecy. When the time will come, we will have nothing to be worried about. Why? We know Hashem is with us. When the mountains will collapse into the ocean. Big mountains. Since it's going to be earthquake and the waters will go all over, Mountains will fall into the water. Mountains can also be big buildings. It's high things. It can be buildings will fall into the water. And it says, Yehemu yechmeru meimav. And the oceans will have tsunamis, waves, waves of huge waves. Ir ashu arim sela. The mountains will shake. The mountains that did not collapse will shake from the strength of Hashem. The rivers, Nahar plagav yesamchu ir elokim. The rivers will surround Jerusalem. Jerusalem doesn't have a river right now. Does it have a river? Doesn't have a river. No river, no lakes, nothing in Jerusalem. But when Gog Magog will be, the water will go all around Jerusalem. Why? Because there will be an earthquake, as, I, as it says in Zachary 14. Water will start coming from the ground, and it will make like a lake around Jerusalem. And the mountain will split to two. Half will go to the south, half will go to the north. So it says, Nahar plagav yesamchu ir elokim. Ir elokim, the city of God is Jerusalem. Kdosh mishkene elion. The holy place. And where the temple of Hashem is, it leaves no doubt that he's speaking about Jerusalem. Elokim bekirba bal timot, Hashem is in it. That's why the city will not be destroyed like the rest of the world. Yeazrea elokim lifnot boker. Hashem will come and save lifne boker. What does it mean lifne boker? Literally it means dawn when the sun begin to rise. But that's not what it means. Hashem will not save Jerusalem in the morning. It can be in the evening, it can be in the afternoon. That's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? I'll tell you the secret here. In the Torah, Yaakov had to fight all night with the minister of Esav, the angel of the Goim. All night Yaakov was fighting with the angel, and in the end, the angel could not win him. So what happened? He touched him in his ligament. It's called Gida Nashe. Right here, there's a ligament. And he made Yaakov crippled. Now he's handicapped. He, he, he has problems walking. Before the angel left, Yaakov asked him, give me a bracha. So he said to him, your name will not be Yaakov. It will, it will be Israel. This is how officially we became Israel, that moment. After, yeah. But what happened, it says in the Torah, after all night of struggle, the sun raised. When the sun raised, the angel surrendered, the angel of the Goim surrendered, and he gave him a blessing. 
In a book of Chinuch, Sefer HaChinuch, one of the most important rabbis in the last thousand years, 800 years ago, in Barcelona, he lived. He wrote that this part in the Torah is talking about the end of days. After thousands of years that we suffer from the goyim with antisemitism and problems and everyone is against us constantly, automatically, and we battle with them, they won't be able to destroy us, but they will hurt us. That's the point here, that it, and it touched him in his gidan his legament. That's why the Jews can never eat that legament when they slaughter the cows, you don't eat it. It's in the back of the cow, you gotta take it out. Very big punishment if somebody eat it. Why? Because there's much, much deeper than what people think. This is symbolizing the salvation of the Jewish nation. What is the salvation? That after thousands of years of struggle and hurt and problems and casualties, the sun would rise to the Jews. The salvation will begin. And then officially, officially, everything will become paradise. After all the suffering, the antisemites, all of them will be wiped out. The rest that survive will all be Jewish lovers. And what would happen? The salvation of the Jews this time will be final. And this is what he writes here, if not Boker, when the light finally comes up, that's when Hashem will protect the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. When? When the salvation will begin. When is the salvation? After Gog and Magog. Hamu goim matu mamlachot. The voice of the goim screaming all the nation for their destruction. Major kingdoms collapse in minutes. Natan bekolot amug aretz. When the mountain and the land is melting. Melting, literally melting. Hashem tzvaot imanu. Hashem is our warrior. He's with us. Misgav lanu Elohe Yaakov Sela is above everyone and he is for eternity with the nation of Jacob. Lechu chazu mifalot Hashem. Go and see the wonders of Hashem. Asher sam shamot ba'aretz. That he made the whole world like a desert. Nothing left. Trees, farms, Everything like one destroyed desert. Back to square one. Even in a creation it was better. Before we developed the world. It's going to be such a situation. Mashbit milchamot at aretz. He will put finally an end to all the wars. From one side of the world to the other side of the world. Keshet yeshaber vekitzetz chanit. All the weapon, all the weapon of the nations. Agalot isrof ba'esh, all the tanks, all the, the carriages, whatever they have, will all go on fire. Nothing will survive. Harpud hu ki'ani ki'anuchi elokim. Everybody should stop with their nonsense and pay attention that I am the God. Arum bagoim, arum ba'aretz. It's time for you to realize that I'm finally going to the highest level. Hashem tzvakot imanu, misgav lanu Eloi Yaakov Sela. We say this in a tefillah a lot. Adonai tzvakot imanu, misgav lanu, when we start tefillat arvit, this is how we start, right? What do we say? We start, Adonai tzvakot imanu, misgav lanu Eloi Yaakov Sela, Adonai tzvakot asher adam botech bach, Adonai oshia melech yaneno viyom korenu. Three verses. First pasu, come from here. The end of that mizmor. Hashem is our strength. Hashem is with the nation of Israel for eternity. That's how this Mizmor finished. Let's move on to chapter 47. And chapter 47 is a continuation of actually of chapter 46, but it's a little different. Summary of chapter 47 is... Actually, we are saying this in, when the Jews gather together in Yerushalayim to accept Malchut Shamayim on the holidays, what we call the festivals. And we actually 
expressing the kingdom of Hashem in this world and the kingdom of Hashem in the upper world. And when a king, when a, man, when a king that is a man is going, we actually nominate him to be the king. At the same time, all the important people gather together. They blow the trumpets and the shofars. And they make a special celebration, an announcement all over Jerusalem that Mr. Such and Such is becoming right now the king. It's not something, ah, okay, somebody won the elections. No. They make a lot of noise all over and people hear shofarot, you know. And everybody clap and everybody sings and the word is spreading to all over the nation. In this Mizmor, there are nine verses besides the first verse, and it's divided to three different uh, parts. Uh, each part has less verses from the other. It's going from high to low. In the first chapter, in the first part, four verses. The second part, three verses. The third part, two verses. The first part is an opening to a ceremony of nominating a king. And it's like inviting all the nations to come and blow the trumpets and cheer for the new king. And, and mention all his victories and his glory. Second part is speaking about the time that Hashem is sitting on his chair of kingdom. When we all blow the shofar, when is it? When do we do that? Rosh Hashanah. Tiku b'chodesh shofar b'kesel yom chagenu. What does it mean, tiku? Tiku b'chodesh, when the month begins, when the year begins. Bakese, what's kese? Kese comes come from the word lechasot, when the moon gets covered. You can see the moon. When can't you see the moon? Beginning of the month. Middle of the month, middle of the Jewish month, the moon is full. From 1 to 15, the moon is growing. From 15 to 30, the moon is decreasing. That's why we only can say Birkat Alevana up to the middle of the month. Once it's decreasing, you don't make a blessing. You make a blessing when you're on the way up, not when you're on the way down. Right? If a person was very religious and is going down spiritually, what is he going to say? Thank you, Hashem, that I'm going down? No. He said, thank you, Hashem, that I'm going up. Not that I'm sinking. Okay, so in this Mizmor, it repeats five times the word singing, Zemer. Also, Trua and voice of Shofar, right? And, on, and the, uh, the third part of it is the conclusion of the ceremony of nominating the king. After the king is sing, sitting on his chair and all the ministers are singing for him, and all the important people of the nation coming in front of him to say that they accept him as a king. So that's, this Mizmor is basically a combination of nominating a king in this world and actually accepting the kingdom of Hashem. Let's see some of the, uh, some of the meaning of this Mizmor. It starts, it's, as I said, it's continuation for the previous Mizmor. After the mess in Milchemet Gog Magog, that the final war left in the world after Mashiach arrived, the world will go back to an order. There will be a period of time that there will be a total mess. But after that, the world will go back to an order, because after every mess, there is always an order eventually. So the world will go back to an order, and all the nation will accept the kingdom of Hashem in Yerushalayim. We read this Mizmor before we blow the shofar in Rosh Hashanah. How many times? Seven times. If you remember every year on Rosh Hashanah, before we blow the shofar, we read this Mizmor seven times. You know, Lam Natsiach Livne Korach Mizmor, Kol Amim Tikukaf, Ariu Leelokim Bekol Rina, Ki Hashem Elion Melech Gadol Al Kol Haaretz. And, and so forth and so on. And then what do we say? Allah Elohim betrua, Hashem bekol shofar. Hashem is rising with the voice of the shofar. So this is what we say seven times. The question is why seven times? Why we have to read the same song seven times? One time it's not enough. 
So the answer is, how many times, how many times the word Elohim appeared in this Mizmor? The answer, seven times. When we read this song seven times, it's seven times seven. In Judaism, everything is around this number seven, and sometimes 49, which is seven times seven, even greater. Most of the important skips in a, in a Torah, the hidden skips, are usually in 49, as you can see. If you open up the Torah, Bereshit bara Elohim tashamayim v'taaretz, Bereshit. You circle the taf of Bereshit, you count 49 letters after, you get to Vav. You circle the Vav, you count 49 letters, you get to Oresh. You circle the resh, you count 49 letters, you get hey. The word Torah is hidden inside in equal skip of 49 letters. It's a code here. Then you go to the book of Shmot, Exodus. It starts, Ve'ele Shmot Bnei Israel. Those are the names of the Jews that got to, went to Egypt with Yaakov. So Ve'ele Shmot, from the word Shmot, finish with Taf. You circle the Taf. You count 49 letters, you get Vav. You count 49 letters, you get Resh. You count 49 letters, you get Hey. Again, Torah. You get Torah. Now you come to the third book of Moses, which is Leviticus, Vaikra. Over there, you don't have Torah. You have the name of God. Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey. What's the skip? Seven. Yud, seven letters, Hey, seven letters. Vav, seven letters, hey. Then you go to the next book, which is Bamidbar, numbers. Bamidbar, this time you have the word Torah from left to right, in equal skip of 49. Then you go to Dvarim, Deuteronomy, from the Taf, you go reverse, 49 letters, you get Vav, 49 letters, 49 letters, hey. So what do we have here? We have a, a menorah with five arms, the middle one is the name of God, which is the center of the creation, the center of everything. And then you have two from right to left and two from left to right. Bereshit and Shmot from right to left, towards the center. Bamidbar and Dvarim from left to right, in equal skip of 49. Seven is very, very important number. Why? Because this world, is a material world. Everything is material. Material, no matter what kind of material you hold in your hand, it has six dimensions. South, north, west, east, up, and down. So this world, maximum six dimensions. What's the seventh dimension? It's like going above material, go coming out of it. Material, you have a boundary. Six dimensions is covering you from all directions. Going out of the material world, that's symbolizing the spiritual world, the world that does not have material. And that's what Judaism is all about. And this is what God is all about. He's not material. He doesn't have any material. Material, it's a creation. Hashem is not a creation. He's the creator. The Jewish people with their divine soul are not just people like bodies. No. Bodies, everybody has, and animals also have bodies. We have this divine neshama, the divine spirit, divine soul. And this is the secret of number seven. This is why Hashem loves this number so much, because it's like a divider between the phony temporary world to the eternal real world. Now, we say this mizmor on Rosh Hashanah. We say it seven times. The name Elohim, seven times, multiply by seven times that we say this means more, 49 times the name Elohim. What's the significance of the name Elohim? Elohim means the judge. When we call God, Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey, like the Goim, they pronounce it literally Jova, but it's really a name that we're not allowed to pronounce. Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey. What is the, the meaning of this word? It's aya ove vie. The four, the four letters of yud, hey, vav, and hey, they're giving us all three times, past, present, and future. 
to show you that God is not subject to time because only material is subject to time. Material is depend on time. Time exists only where material exists. When there's no material, the time that you measure here doesn't exist. The meaning of the word Bereshit, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning. What does it mean in the beginning? Beginning is mean, it means time. Beginning, middle, end, that means time. How there was time if there's no world yet? That's showing that Bereshit means the creation of material. When Hashem created the raw material of this world, time started ticking. That's called Bereshit, in the beginning. That's when the that clock began to move. The meaning of the word Bereshit, in the beginning, means creation of material, meaning creation of time. It goes together. You cannot separate one with the, from the other. Material and time always goes together. Okay, so now, why do we have to mention the name of God 49 times before we blow the shofar? Because there are 49 gates of wisdom and purity. 49 sha'are tahara. One for each one of them. And this is what we say, Ve'ashem imloch ba'olam, Mashiach would come, the Messiah would come, God will be the king according to all opinion, everyone would understand that, and the voice of shofar will be heard all over the world. Imagine a shofar that you hear everywhere, China, Japan, Middle East, Europe, everybody hear a voice of shofar. That's what's going to be when Mashiach will arrive. Shofar of Eliyahu Navi. And this is what we say, Tik Ukaf. What does it mean to tik ukaf? Today, in a, in a modern Hebrew, tokea kaf means shaking hand, agreement. You shake someone's hand. Your hand is 14. Yad, in Hebrew, yud, it's 10. Dalet, it's 4. And your friends that gives you the hand, his hand is also 14. 14 together with another 14, it's 28. Numeric value, koach, strength what two can do is a lot better than double. In other words, if a person can pick up with his hands 100 pounds, and the other friends can pick up 100 pounds, you may assume that when they pick up something together, they can pick up maximum 200 pounds. The answer, no. They can pick up more than that. Why? When there are people united, it gives them extra strength. Same thing if you take one straw, you can bend it with two fingers. But if you put 100 straws, they're all very soft. But they're all, adjust, they're all attached to each other. You can't even break it. You cannot fold it. Why? It became very thick and hard. It's not elastic anymore. Why? Unity is important. So what's the secret over here? The secret over here is that uh, we say tik ukaf, Kaf, it's numeric value, 100. Half, it's 20. Pay, it's 80. Tiku, it's blowing the shofar, tokea. Tiku, kaf, blow 100 times. That's why we blow 100 times shofar in Rosh Hashanah. 30, 30, 30, and 10 in the end. Why? To make it 100 times. The official reason is because after Sisra got killed by Yael, she made him drink thick milk and chop his head off in Machshimo, this Sisra. So they brought his head. When his mother heard that her son died, she started to scream with crying, 100 crying. It's a big argument how she was crying. Like, ah, one long one, or ah, 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 or ah, 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 ah. ah. There's all different kinds of opinion how a crying one. That's why we blow different kinds of shofar. We blow short one, two, 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 and then two, long one, and then two, two, two. Well, when you pay attention to the shofar and you close your eyes, it sounds like a crying of a person with a broken heart. And this is bringing mercy into the world before our judgment. Why, from all the instruments on the world, we blow the shofar? Why not trumpet? Why not other things? There's many things you can blow. Why you have to blow the shofar, which is the horn of the ram, of, of, the, of the deers? Why do you use it? Why? 
the, why the Gemara is saying you cannot use from the ox, from the cow. You cannot use it. Why? Because when Avraham Avinu took his son Isaac to slaughter him in a Moriah mountain, and Hashem came and said to him, don't touch the boy. And Avraham was begging, let me finish the mitzvah. And Hashem said, no, you already proved yourself. Now I put my stamp on you that you're fearful from Hashem, from God. You're 100% righteous. Once HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Avraham in Akeda, now I know that you're 100% tzaddik. We use this before we blow the shofar in front of Hashem. We use this shofar as a memory of the Akeda. We use it as the Akeda to remind Hashem, don't forget our father Avraham that he was willing to kill his son after 100 years that he was waiting for him, and you just told him, take him. You didn't order him. You asked. He, could, he had hundreds of reasons why he should not touch the boy. He could say to you, what example you're going to give the goyim to kill the children? You promised me that my nation would come out of this boy. You're contradicting yourself. When you give a gift, you never take it back. Abraham had so many authentic reasons, alacha, alacha, to argue with Hashem and win the argument. And Hashem had to surrender and tell him, you're right, you're not allowed to touch the boy. But he put his head on the side and he made himself 100% devoted to Hashem. And what happened in the end? When we come to blow the shofar, we, when Hashem, when the Satan sees this shofar, he gets very, very scary. Very, he gets very scared. Hazal say, why we stand up and we sit and we blow the shofar when we stand, then we sit down? The answer, lebalbel ta Satan. It drives the Satan crazy. The Satan has fear from this. Why? So everybody thinks the Satan is some kind of a fool. He hears siren of shofar, he gets scared. How many years you can be a fool? One time you heard siren, nothing happened. Next year again, nothing happened. Next year again, nothing happened. 2,000 years we blow the shofar, nothing happened. The Satan should get the point already, no? So why the Satan get scared? The answer is, the Satan doesn't really get scared from the voice of the shofar. The Satan, when he hears the shofar, he gets scared because right away, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has mercy that moment. Why? Because it brings the name of Avraham Avinu that was willing to kill his son, and in the end he took the ox, the, 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 the ram that was stuck there with his horn in the bush. He took him, he slaughtered him instead of Yitzchak, and this is reminding in Shamaim the Akedat Yitzchak, right away the Jewish people have big mercy and a judgment. Why the name of Shofar is Shofar? It should have been Karen. Karen means horn. Why the Torah call it shofar? Why? Because it's come from the word meshaper. Meshaper means to improve. As soon as the Jew hears shofar, he feels that his heart is dropping to his pants. Why? <gasps> Judgment. Yom Adin. People begin to get scared. Back in the day, 40, 50 years ago in Israel, when they used to say, ladies and gentlemen, Elul. No shofar, no Rosh Hashanah, no nothing. Just Rosh Chodesh Elul, they go in a shul. Elul, half of the people used to faint. Falling, Persian, Moroccan, Iraqi, Yemenite, Polish. They all fall on the floor and faint. Where well, get up, what happened? Wow, Yom Adin in 30 days. <gasps> Yom Adin. Rav Shach, Alava Shalom, he one time gave a drasha in Ponovich Yeshiva. He gave this drasha after they killed the Machshimo Adolf Eichmann. And he said, come and see the difference between a Jewish soul to a, a soul of Amalek. Come and see the difference. A Jewish person, you say to him one month before Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Chodesh Elul, the Ashkenazim blow the shofar, Rosh Chodesh Elul, half of the people faint. But we have 30 days to prepare. But everyone is under panic. Wow, Yom Adin, Slichot. This Nazi, he knows that in one hour they're going to hang him and to burn his body. 
And they ask him, what do you want, Adolf? What does he say? I want a glass of red wine. I want a steak. And I want German newspaper. And you should see how he was eating. And in half an hour, they're going to hang you. Enjoying the steak. What? A person get a ticket, $200. Two weeks before he goes to the court to fight, he's nervous. Wow, courtroom, Judge Williams. <laughs> what happened? $200. He's shaking. Ah, bet me It makes me nervous. He's uh, one hour before they kill him. He eats steaks, drink the wine, read the newspaper. Nothing. No khatati, aviti, God, forgive me. If you exist, please have mercy on me. I made a mistake. Nothing like this. In Israel, Yom Adin, Rosh Hashanah, people play sheshbesh in a kineret. The belly outside, eating seeds, playing sheshbesh. They're also not aware, but what's the difference? He knows he's getting killed. It doesn't bother him. These Jews don't even know today it's Rosh it's Yom Adin. Ask the typical Israeli in Tiberia on the, on the beach there. Hey, Itzik, Avi, Moshe, what's today? Holiday. What holiday? Rosh Hashanah. What is it? The beginning of a new Jewish year. No, and what's in it? What? Picnic, shish kebab, kaduregel, boating. They don't even know it's Yom Adin. So this is the secret of this Mizmor. We say it before we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah seven times. Allah Elohim betrua, Hashem bekol shofar. Because the name of Hashem is seven times in this Mizmor. And we say it seven times, so it makes it 49. 49 Sha'are Bina. And this, like I said, is bring big rachamim on the Jewish nation. What's one more reason we blow the shofar? is because it reminds Ma'amad Ar Sinai that the Jewish nation say Na'aseh Nishma when they heard the voice of Shofar V'kol Ha'ar Ashan Tachad Ya'asher Yarad Alav Ha'elokim Ba'esh V'kol Shofar O'lech V'chazek Elokim Yedaber Moshe Yedaber V'elokim Ya'anenu B'kol That's what it says in Parashat Yitro So what does it say? The voice of the Shofar was so loud and everything was shaking Everybody scream, Naaseh Nishma. We don't ask questions. A real kosher Jew doesn't need proofs. Tochiach. How do I know the Torah is from Hashem? How do I know the Gemara is from Hashem? Everything is one, two, three to prove. But a kosher Jew needs proof. Ah, they don't use your head. You don't see the world. What, what do you think? There's no God. What do you think? Every Arab, before he go and kill children, he scream, Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. In the name of God, we'll kill this innocent baby. This monster understands there is a God, and you, the professor, don't understand. How can it be doctor in a hospital? They see so many miracles every week in the hospital with the patients, so many things. How the brilliance of the body, the vaccine, how the body produces vaccine against all kinds of infections, and, and they don't, they don't, they're just like robots. 40 years in the hospital doesn't make him to think. Everything coincidence, coincidence. So here is the secret of this mizmor. We'll do it, and then time will run out. Maybe we can do another mizmor after. We'll see. This is another song that the children of Korach that made Shuvah and did not die with their father, they throw this mizmor. All the nations... Tikukaf means clap to Hashem. Clap. Clap for what Hashem did. The question is, why the nation should praise Hashem that he helped the Jews? The answer is, they know how much problems they prepared for the Jews, and every time they came to do it, Hashem destroyed it. We don't even know how many things they had for us. We don't know. They know better than us. How many things, you know, remember in the last war that the, one of the heads of the Hamas, they interview him for the newspaper, and the American guy asked him, you already shot 4,000 missiles. You don't hit even one. What did the Arab answer him? Do you remember or no? The answer, the Arabs say, what do you think? We don't know how to shoot. We have training. We have radars. We shoot. We know exactly where the missile should fall before it falls. 
But what can we do that their God is saving them? A person can be that dumb. He shot 4,000 times, nothing happened. You see, the God is protecting Israel. Instead of stop shooting, <laughs> well, you're normal. You go against Hashem. You see that Hashem protecting his children. Why don't you stop? Why? So it says, What is Tiku Kaf? Kaf Gimatria 100. That's why we blow Shofar 100 times. 30, 30, 30, and 10 in the end. 100 times. Tiku Kaf. 100 times. That's the secret here in this Mizmor. Praise Hashem. With singing, Ki Hashem Elyon Nora, because Hashem is above our understanding. Melech Gadol al Kol Haaretz, huge king on the entire world. Yadber Amim Tachtenu. What's Yadber? When you have uh, ants, cockroaches, what do you, you call the exterminator? He comes, he cleans everything. That's how Hashem will clean the world from all the Reshaim. Yadber Amim Tachtenu, Uleumim Tachat Raglenu. All the empires of the world will all be under the feet of the Jewish nation. Imagine this Pakistan, India, China, America. Nothing will be left from all these names. Everybody would understand. If Harlanu et Nahalato, Hashem will finally give us the real original Holy Land. All the way to Syria, all the way to Iraq. Massive, big. Jerusalem will be all the way to Damascus. Jerusalem, the name, what's the name of Jerusalem in the Tanakh? It doesn't have Yud in it. Jerusalem. Why there's no Yud? Because it's not perfect yet. The Gemara said there are seven barren people in the history of the world. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Hana, all these barren people. All the barren people there are six of them already had salvation. The seventh one did not have salvation yet. Who is the seventh one? Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is still Akara. What does it mean, Yerushalayim, Akara? Still barren. Once it doesn't have Bet HaMikdash. Bet HaMikdash is the baby of Yerushalayim. Without the Bet HaMikdash, Yerushalayim doesn't work a lot. So when Mashiach comes, finally Yerushalayim will also have a baby. What is it? Bet HaMikdash. But the Gemara called Yerushalayim Eretz Tzvi. What does it mean, Eretz Tzvi? The land of the deer. What's special about the deer? If you take the skin of the deer and you heat it, you can pull it more and more. It doesn't get ripped. It becomes wider and wider. It's very interesting. Other skin, you pull, you pull, you pull. Oh, it get ripped. But this is very nice. It's elastic. They, the Gemara say they used to make Sifre Torah from the skin of the deer. They used to start, they put, uh, they put uh, grass, and then the deer eats it, and then they slaughter them. They give the meat to the poor people to eat. They take the skin, they remove the air, and eventually they make Sefer Torah, and they teach one rabbi was in charge of everything. The Gemara said the whole process, meaning they used to use it for Sifre Torah. And by the way, you should know deer is kosher. Why, if deer is kosher, why we don't sacrifice deer in Bet HaMikdash? We sacrifice sheep, we sacrifice cows, but we, and doves, birds, for the poor people. But we don't bring deers. Why? Deer is kosher. Giraffe is also kosher. Bison is also kosher. There's other kosher animals. Why we don't sacrifice them? Bison, they sell in, uh, next to Monsi. Bison meat, they sell. Glad kosher. The answer is, this is what Hashem said to the Jewish people. Why are you complaining all the time? Even when I told you to do something, I made it the easiest possible way for you. I didn't ask you to bring deer to sacrifice because it's very hard to catch them. Sheep, you come, you come. <laughs> What's the goat? You take the goat and you bring him. Cow, cow cannot run. Deer, it's very hard to catch. Oh, you can catch a deer. Remember, there was no cars back in the day, no, no guns, nothing like that. It's very difficult to catch a deer. If you come to catch it, it begins to run. Let's see you catching a giraffe and bringing it to the Mizbeach in Bet HaMikdash. 
500 people you need for it. He gives you one with the head. <laughs> 500 people fall on the floor. How are you going to sacrifice giraffe? By the way, why we don't need giraffe today? Let's see you slaughtering giraffe. You need a ladder like the fire, fireman. Until you get to the top to cut, the giraffe move the head, you and the ladder goes all the way to the Red Sea. Why? How are you going to catch a giraffe? Today we don't know anymore where to slaughter. We don't have any more mesora. It's kosher, nobody ate it. Who needs the headache to get giraffe? So since nobody ate giraffe, we don't know anymore where to cut. A cow and, and all the other animals that we ate, we know. The giraffe, to the best of my knowledge, never. But I want to tell you, do you know grasshoppers? Grasshoppers are also kosher, the big ones. But you need to know to look at their belly, how their belly look, how their belly look under. Some of them kosher, some of them are not kosher. Do you understand? So let me just finish this. It says like this. Ha'ariu le'elokim bekol rina, ki Hashem elion melech al kol ha'aretz, Yadber amim tachtenu, exterminate all the enemies of the Jewish nation under our feet. Ivchar lanu et nachalato, he will make our land superb. Et geon Yaakov asher ha'ev sela, bet ha'mikdash that he loves so much. Ala elokim betrua, Hashem is rising with a voice of trua. Hashem bekol shofar, in a voice of shofar. Zamru Elokim Zameru, sing to Hashem, sing. Zamru Lemalkenu Zamru, sing to our king, sing. Kimelech Kola Aretz Elokim, because Hashem is the king of the whole land. Zamru Maskil, what does it mean, Maskil? With wisdom. It's music, it's big wisdom. The greater guitar player you are, the wiser you are in music. The better you play violin, like Perelman, the Jewish. The handicapped man on a wheelchair, did you see how he plays violin? You sit next to him 10 minutes, he takes you to a different world, the way he plays. He's the one who plays Schindler List back in the day with the violin. One of the best uh, pianists in the world. Not everyone can play like him. You, you can hear other people play, it's nice. There's nothing to compare. So Hashem saying, I just sing. Everybody that knows how to play two accords will come to. Take the best ones, the best musicians. They are the ones who should pray, that everything will be perfect. Malach Elokim al kol goim, al goim. Hashem will control all the nation. Elokim yashav al kise kotsho. Hashem is finally sitting on his chair of kingdom. Nedive amim neesafu. All the ministers of the nation are gathering. Am Elokei Avraham to the Jewish nation. Everybody that survived from all the, the goyim, the important goyim that survived, they did not get clean. They're all coming now to Jerusalem to see the wonder of the third temple and the music that the Jewish people play to Hashem with Mashiach. Ki Elokim magine eretz me'od na'ala because the protection of the land that Hashem performed is superb. And I never saw such thing. Such wonders that Hashem made for the Jewish people. We finish now chapter 47, and we have time, Baruch Hashem, so we can do another one. Chapter 48, we'll give a short summary of this Mizmor. Chapter 48, it's also Shir Mizmor Libne Korach, so it's also from the children of Korach. And let's give a little short summary. This, this song is talking about the praise of Zion, which means Israel, Jerusalem, the glory of the, of the divinity of Hashem in the city. And is actually said when all the pilgrims, they go up on a festival three times a year to Jerusalem. They came from all over to see the glory of Jerusalem and to see, they actually are amazed from the beauty. And they feel the spirit of Hashem there. 
The first part of this Mizmor is speaking about how big and great Hashem is in a city and the palaces of Jerusalem. And the second part is talking about how the kings were shaking when they saw what performance Hashem made in Jerusalem. Some say that it's also referring to something that already took place in history. When the kings came to occupy Jerusalem, when they came close to the city, they got so scared and they turned around and left. Some say that this king came from, with boats, not only with horses. They came with boats, Boniot Tarshish. And Hashem sent a storm, Ruach Kadim, and broke all their boats. When they saw that, they realized that Hashem doesn't want them to touch Jerusalem, so they all turned back and left. Some say that it's also referring to the war between Yehoshaphat against Moab and Ammon. That's what it means, Beruach Kadim Teshaber on Tarshish, with a storm, strong wind, you break the boats. It's hinting that Yehoshaphat made boats and the boats were broken. And some say it's speaking about Sancheriv in the time of King Hizkiyahu when 185,000 of his soldiers died overnight, as I mentioned before. But the main translation of this Mizmor is, of, as I say, to the future to come. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, the third part of this Mizmor is the pilgrim are actually uh, witnessing themselves the city of Hashem became complete again, and the glory of Hashem is spreading all over the world. This will be days that we never had in a history. The question is, are we going to be righteous enough to see it, or not, God forbid? Someone that's not Shomer Shabbat can only dream to see it, but he will never do. You have to be Shomer Shabbat, you have to be honest, you have to be modest, you have to eat kosher, you have to learn Torah every day. Women must cover their body modestly. All these things are conditional. If you pass the test, you will get to see it. Like they said, the Savior come to the Jewish nation, but to whom? To whom he comes? To eat sick with the earring and the ponytail? No, not for them. He comes for the real children of God, the devoted one, the ones that did everything the Torah say. Leshave Pesha Be'akov, to those who return back from their crimes against Hashem. They made tshuva, real tshuva. They were not racist, they love everyone, they respect people, they give charity, they're not selfish, they help the rabbis that made Bale tshuva, supporting them, they went into partnership with them, they're not keeping all their money for the day they die, they think they're gonna take it with them to the grave. They use their money. The next Mizmor, is speaking about stingy people that reserve all the money for themselves until they die. Who wrote that Mizmor, the next one? The children of Korach. Who were they talking about? Their father, which was the richest man in the world. Until today in Israel, when they want to say someone is a multimillionaire, how do you say rich in Hebrew? Ashir. What do they say in Hebrew? Ashir ka Korach. Is wealthy like Korach. Bill Gates was a puppet compared to Korach. The Gemara says Korach had, if I remember correctly, 300 donkeys full of sacks of keys for his treasures, where he was hiding all his gold and diamonds and whatever. So he couldn't count his well. And what happened in the end? He got swallowed alive with his ego and pride. And until today, scream in hell, Moshe emet v'torato emet. Try to imagine how Korach's heart is burning when he see all the billions and trillions that he left here and he did not even enjoy it. Think about it. He should have entered the Holy Land and become the, you know, one of the leaders, but his jealousy destroyed him and buried him alive. So it says like this. Uh, so the... the, the the summary of this Mizmor is continuing that it's speaking about surrendering all the nations, speaking about their, their recovery of Jerusalem, 
the remedy of Jerusalem after the final war of Gog and Magog. This song we read every Monday when we pray Shachrit. Why? Mizmor Shir Leom Asheni. Why? Because they used to sing it in Bet HaMikdash on a second day, on Monday. Why they sang this Mizmor? Because in this Mizmor, you know, it was in Bet HaMikdash, the choir, they used to sing it on Monday. But the question is, what's special about this Mizmor? The answer is, this Mizmor is Monday Hashem created Gehenom, Hell. You don't see in a Torah, Vayi Erev, Vayi Boker, Yom Sheni. You have on the first day, and it was evening, and it was morning, one day. On Monday, you don't have this sentence. It jumped to Tuesday, Tuesday, you have it twice. One for Tuesday, one for Monday. Why on Monday Hashem did not write in the Torah, and Hashem saw his creation, and it's very well? Monday wasn't a very well creation. The answer is, Monday... Hashem created hell. This is a place when people, wicked people, are getting burned. As I already told you before, Auschwitz is a picnic compared to hell. If you already read one time what happened over there in Gehenom for the wicked people. But that's not the only reason. The second reason why Hashem didn't say on Monday that it's good, because the water split. Water went up, water went down. There was a separation. Hashem doesn't like separations, machloket. So we say this Mizmor. Now what's special about this Mizmor? In this Mizmor, we say the word leva, le, le, Levavcha, instead of Levavcha, how do we use? We don't use the word Levavcha. We use Libchem, not Levavchem. Why in the Torah it say Levavchem, but in this Mizmor it say Libchem? We're missing one bet. The Gemara say, what does it mean? Ve'avta et Hashem elokecha bechol levavcha. He should have said bechol libcha. What levavcha? It's like duplication. The answer, the yetzer ara and the yetzer atov. Both inclination. The evil inclination and the good inclination. But this Mizmor is speaking about the day of Mashiach after Gog and Magog war. What's the significance of these days that Hashem destroyed the Satan? No more Yetzer Hara, no more evil inclination. That's why it's Libchem, not Levavchem. Because nobody anymore have Yetzer Hara. No more desire for bad things. No more stealing, no more killing, no more Lashon Hara, no more modesty issues. Nobody has desire to do bad. Right now, why we do bad things? Why? Only for the desire. Only for the desire. If a person comes to make a sin right now, you come and tell him, don't make the sin. Say, only this time, Rabbi, I promise. I have to, I have to. Don't stop me, I have to. From tomorrow, I do tshuva. What's the only way that he can convince him not to do it? What's the only way? He goes to make a sin with Christine. How are you going to make him not go? You offer him money. Tell him, don't go, I'll pay you. Don't go. How much you give me? A hundred bucks. Eh, for a hundred bucks, I'm not giving up this desire. Okay, I give you five hundred. No, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars, you give me not to go? Okay, give me the money. He gives them the money. Christine, I, I'm sick, I can't come. What happened? He has two opposite desire. Desire to go to Christine, desire to get money. The desire for the money, because it's a big amount, overcome the desire to go make a sin. You understand what's happening? But in the days of Mashiach, you won't have no desire for money, no desire for Christine. Maybe there won't be Christine out there. Why? I'll tell you why. Because where this name Christine came? From Christ. Those Christines that are righteous, in case they are righteous Gentile, immediately will replace their name to a better name. It will be an embarrassment to be called after an idol, false idol. And many of those Christines will not survive because they didn't keep the seven law of Noah, like the Gentiles has to keep. So one way or the other, there will not be any Christines left in the world. And no Chris. Why? And no Muhammad. All the Arabs that will survive in case they were righteous and kept the seven law, 
right away will destroy this name Muhammad. Why? Or Ali. Because they know it's all come from a fake religion, false religion. Nobody would want anything that link him to an idol worshipping or to a fake religion. Right away, people will replace all their names in case they'll have a bad name. So their names will only be kosher. Do you understand what I'm talking about or no? So let me conclude here. It says like this. So this Mizmor, as we said, it says, Shitu, shitu libchem, not levavchem. Ki, because on that day, there would not be any more Yetzirah. The literal meaning of this Mizmor, Shir Mizmor Lebne Korach, song that was written by the children of Korach, Gadol Hashem, whom hulal meod. Hashem is great and very praised. Beir, where the word hallelujah came from? Hallelujah. What's hallelujah? Even the goim sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Where does it come from? It's two words. Hallelujah. What's hallelujah? Praise. Yeah, it's the name of Hashem. You then hey. Why the name of Hashem that usually it's Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey, all of a sudden sometimes appear in the Torah, it's half, only Yud and Hey? The answer, because Hashem say, my name is incomplete until I will erase the memory of Amalek from the face of the earth. As long as there are these Goim from the nation of Amalek alive in the world, my name is incomplete. Only after I exterminate all these wicked Nazis from the world, all of them, for making so much problems for my children over the years, only then my name will be complete. So until then, we say Yud Hey. But in the end, Bezrat Hashem, it will be complete. So what does it mean, Hallelujah? Praise Yah, praise Hashem. Hallelujah. It's praise to praise. Hallel. What do we do, Hallel, in Yom Tov? We sing Hallel, we're praising Hashem. So it says like this. It says, Gadol Hashem umulal meod, it's very praised, Be'ir Elokeinu Har Kocho, in the city of our God, Jerusalem, the mountain of holiness. Yefenof, the whole area is beautiful. Mesos kol ha'aretz. Where, what's the word mesos? Come from the word sas. Sas anochi alimratech kemotzech shalal rav. Sas means I'm so happy, my heart comes out from happiness. We, when we do Brit Milah for the babies, what do we say? We say, Sas Anochi, I'm so happy. Anochi means me. Anochi al imratech. I'm so delighted to listen to what you order me to do. Al imratech. For what you commanded me to do. Ke shalal rav. Like a person that finds a treasure on the street. A poor person walk, is depressed, doesn't have money for anything. His life is destroyed. All of a sudden, he finds a bag, he opens it up, 20 big diamond, 10 carat each. In one second, he became the richest guy in the world. What happiness he will have. He'll run on the street like Mishugak, calling people he didn't speak 10 years. Brother, come. What, what do you remember me now? He doesn't know what to do from his happiness. He runs like crazy. Why? This is how we say in the Brit Milah, Sas Hashem, I'm so happy that I have the opportunity to cut to circumcise my baby because you commanded us to do, like I just found a treasure on the street. This is what we say. The father of the baby. What does he say? Right? A broken heart, down to earth, Hashem will never turn down. Right? This is a moment that we bring mercy to the world when we circumcise the babies. You know, there's one, one big tzaddik mohel in Brooklyn. He's an old man. He circumcised for free. He doesn't want to take money. This is the way it should be, according to the law. He refused to take money. But he, only, he doesn't only circumcise babies. He circumcised adults, like Russian Jews that in Russia nobody knew how to do, you know, Brit Mila. So some of them 40, 50, even 70 years old. Before they die, they, they, all their life they were arelim. The Judaism of the person is incomplete when he was not that circumcised. So I already sent him a few people. As a matter of fact, I, was, I spoke to him two hours ago before the lecture to tell him that we're sending him another boy. 
Another boy, that the mother is Jewish, the father was not Jewish, the father refused to let her circumcise the baby. That's the price you pay when you marry a guy. What do you, what do you care about your religion? But the, the, the way the mother became religious, it's so impressing, impressing how they do tshuva, people that were in the end of the world when it comes to spirituality. But the, but the difficulty to correct the damage that you made to your soul is not so simple. But with such devotion, people willing to do it. And this tzaddik is so happy every time I call him and I tell him I have somebody to send you for Brit Milah. It's like he found a treasure on the street. Oh, yes, good. Send him, send him. Thank you. <laughs> now, how much you pay me? $600. Not, not worth it for me. Okay, okay, come. I'll give you more. How much more? I need to know. A thousand. Uh, well, I'll ask my son if he wants to do it. Why? He doesn't even care about the mitzvah. He thinks, how much I'm going to get? But this one, pure. Pure, all the converts that we convert, he saved them $10,000 if they have to go to the hospital now. Four years old man needs to be circumcised now in a hospital in a surgery. How much is going to cost him? One day hospital, $3,000. Uh, anesthesiology is to make the anesthesia, who knows, probably 1500 the actual doctor that it's, he calls it an operation. Root canal calls a few thousand dollars today. So a minimum ten thousand dollars. This rabbi could have been very rich. Just from the converts that we made, he could have made, I don't know, hundred thousand dollars minimum. More, much more. What am I talking about? Half a million dollars he could have made. But he refused to take money. Why? He's so happy. Like, and he's not the father of the son. So he asked me one time, you come to be the sandak? <laughs> I say, I'd rather be Sandak for little babies, not for... <laughs> but I love how pure this is, uh, rabbi is. It's mamash, you can see the way the Torah wants people to be. From time to time, you meet people like this. It's wonderful, wonderful when you see someone that does not have anything bad in his mind. No money, no kavod, no what's in it for me. Just to be able to do what Hashem wants me to do. Ah, I'm so happy. Like David Amelech was. So it says here, it says like this. Yefenov mesos kol haaretz. Mesos comes from the word sas. The happiness of the whole world, Jerusalem. The heart of the world. No wonder why everyone fight for Jerusalem. Even the Arabs fighting for Jerusalem, even though in, in the Quran it is not mentioned once. You don't have the word Yerushalayim in the Quran even once. But they, after Yerushalayim, full force, they don't give up. Why? They've got the point. Later, they woke up later. Because if they were smart, they would put it in their fake Quran to begin with, which will make a bigger problem. You see, it's in the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad said that Jerusalem has to be ours. But in the Quran, it said the opposite, it belongs to the Jews. <laughs> but by the time they woke up, they have an agenda. They don't care about the Quran. They only care to go against the Jews. That's their job in the world. Ishmael Pere Adam. So what does it say? Ar Tzion Yerketei Tzafon, Kiryat Melech Rav Elokim Be'armenotea Noda Lemisgav. Let's explain. The mountain of Zion, Yarketei Tzafon. What does it mean, Yarketei Tzafon? That is facing the north. Kiryat Melech Rav, the city of the king, the great king. Elokim be'armenotea nodale misgav. By looking at Jerusalem, you see the glory of God. Ki hinei ha'melachim nohadu avru yachdav. All the kings gather together to get to Jerusalem. Hem ha'ra'u ken tamau. When they saw it, they got shocked. They were wondering. Nivalu, they got scared. Nechpazu, they ran away. Re'ada chazatam sham. They shake, they shook from, from fear. Chil kayoleda, like a woman before giving birth. How nervous she is for the first time. First time she's pregnant. She doesn't know what to expect. Everyone tells her, it's, it's, it's horrible, it hurts. 
make sure you take epidural. No, but my mother say you have to take the pain. That's the tikkun of the woman. Don't listen to her. Trust me. Take it. Then another one say, I took it five years. My back hurts. It's a whole debate. She's shaking. And she comes to the hospital from all the fear. The doctor say, relax. You'll be out of here before you realize. She's very nervous. She's sweating. Some women, they nervous from the pain. Some women, they nervous if it's gonna be another girl. Because <laughs> the macho, shubinist husband, is sitting and counting the second to check. Will he have a third girl with no boys that he can go and scream over there? <laughs> The interesting part is that the man scream at his wife, how many girls, give me one boy. But in reality, the sex of the baby is determined by the man. The woman has nothing to do with that. Did you know that or no? Yeah. Huh? Did you know that? Yeah. It's actually the man is determ determining the sex of the baby. All right, so let's finish it. So it says like this, when the king, they got, they got feared like a woman before giving birth. Beruach Kadim Teshaber Oniot, with a strong wind that comes from the, from the east, it broke their boats. What does it mean, Tarshish? Tarshish, it's the name of a place, a city called Tarshish, that they all came from there. I don't know exactly in the world today which city is the old Tarshish, but I, it comes from the east, come from the east. Kasher Shamanu Ken Rainu, as we heard, we finally saw. There's one thing to hear, and there's a different thing to see. When you hear, it's only one sense. If you're blind, you don't smell, you, you don't have hands, you, 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 you only can only hear. They have only one sense working, so you get a little idea what's happening around you. That's it. If you open up your eyes, millions of details are coming in one second, what you couldn't hear, right? So. Obviously, a picture is mu much more actual than, uh, than to hear something. So it's a kasher shamanu, as we heard from our fathers, but we didn't know exactly what to imagine. We heard, but we didn't know how it's going to be. Now we have the opportunity to see in our own eyes. Be'ir Hashem Tzvakot Ir in a city of the great God, the God, the city of our God. Elokim yechonenea ad olam sela. Hashem will rebuild Jerusalem for eternity this time. The eternity of the world. Diminu Elokim chasdecha. Hashem, we were imagining how your salvation would be for thousands of years. We didn't know exactly how it's going to be. We read, we heard, but we didn't know. Uh, your kindness, Bekerev Echalecha, in the place of Bet HaMikdash, Keshimcha Elokim Ken Tehilatecha At Katzvei Eretz, as the greatness of your name, God, that's how your glory for all over the world, Tzedek Malai Eminecha, justice, kindness, fulfill the entire world from your right arm. It's a uh, metaphoric. Isma Har Tzion, the mountain of Zion, meaning the Moriah mountain of Jerusalem, will be happy, rejoice. Tagel Nabnot Yehuda, the women of Jerusalem will all be happy. Lema'an Mishpatecha, right? For all the judgment and the revenge that you did to all the enemies of your children. Sobu Tzion ve'akifua, go around Jerusalem, Surround Jerusalem, count the beautiful buildings that Hashem built. She to libchem lechela, pay attention to the walls around Jerusalem that makes it a strong city. Pasgu armenotea leman tesapru ledor acharon, and see the the height of the palaces of Jerusalem that you will tell the children in the final generation. Kizeh Elokim Elokenu Olam Vaed Hu Yena'agenu Almut. This is our God, the eternal God, that will direct us peacefully and quietly to safety. 
We finished chapter 48, and we'll do the last one for today, which will be chapter 49, and time will run out in a few minutes. Chapter 49, it's also written by the children of Korach, and uh, the summary of this Mizmor, the summary of this Mizmor is, in the beginning, the writer is writing to ordinary people, to all people on earth, to all the nations, to all different kinds of people he's referring to. He calls his words, words of wisdom and, uh, and intelligence. And he say, I'm saying to you this, when the voice of the violin is in the background. Why? Sometimes a person has concentration more when you play little relaxing music. The music makes him relax, and from all the hectic day that he had, it relaxes his spirit, and the things that he hears absorb better. That's why, by the way, when they teach the children in, in yeshiva, Little kids, five, six, seven years old, how do they know the Torah so well? How do they learn in two, three years the whole Torah? Because they sing it. If they would talk it, they would not learn it in 20 years. Because the teacher, the Rebbe, is singing with them, that's how they remember everything like a song. And whenever I ask my kids one question, they need, it, they need to sing the whole chapter to be able to know what to answer. If I have to tell them to say it without the melody, they will get confused. But the melody is something in the soul of a person that it comes with music, it's higher spiritual. Like the Gaon Mivilna said that the gate of music is almost in heaven to the gate of the Torah. So Torah and music combined, what can be better? But not this kind of music. This kind of music, I don't want to tell you where it will send you. So it says that it's talking about something important, speaking to all mankind about the fate of a person after he died. How much a person has to put effort to win life of eternity. He says, there's nothing to fear from the bad, and there's nothing really to fear the dead, unless you didn't do what you had to do. Of course, now you have a problem. Let's see what this Mizmor has to tell us. Chapter 49, speaking, Shimu, Shimu, there are two words here, Shimu and Azinu. What's the difference? What's the difference between listen, Shimu, and hear? To listen or to hear? What's the difference? The answer is Shimu is from far away. Alach Shimo Lerachok, his reputation traveled far away. That's Lishmoa, you can hear from far. Azinu means in a conversation, close, from close, which means paying better attention, not just voice from far. Now you understand what you're talking, what you're hearing. Yoshvei Khaled, there's people that sit in Khaled. What Khaled? Not Khaled Mashal or Assad, no. Khaled comes from the word Khulda. What's Khulda? Khulda, it's a big rat. Not the little mice. The big rats, you know the ones that you see them, you want to hide under the ground from fear? Those huge ones. I know somebody works in plumbing, in projects, in, uh, somewhere in New Jersey. And he goes to houses of minorities, people that are very poor. He told me, you have no idea what I see in their houses. You will never believe how these people live. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have a huge hole in the sheet rack. And the woman, she said to me, you know what's this hole from? The rats make it. She had rats like, like the size of a cat coming into her kitchen, jumping on the thing. Imagine living like this. I have goosebumps in my body just from telling you that. And they live like that. How will you, how will you be able to fall asleep knowing there's such a big rat walking? 
why he's referring to the people and he compared them to these rats. What's mutual to the rich people and the rats? Because this is more, it's words of ethic and criticism to the rich, stingy people. What's going together with a rat to a rich, stingy, stingy man together? What's mutual between the rat and that man? The answer, the rat accumulate food nonstop, more and more and more. He never eat that food. Well, hiding, taking, putting, taking more, returning, taking more. What for? You, you up to here. You don't need. You're good for the whole week. What do you worry? The rats will never use their saving. The rich people, 99% of them, the day they die, they did not use even a small portion of what they saved. And that's caused them a huge pain and agony. As soon as they realize they won't come back to their Lexus and Mercedes and to the beautiful home, they just finished installing the chandeliers and the, you know, and the windows and that, and they imported that from Italy, it took a year until it arrived. It was discontinued, they had to search for it for a year. Finally, they finished their palace, heart attack. They're on the way to Gehenom now for not using it for Torah and for mitzvot and for the yeshivot and to save some souls. And now, not only they bolt from this side, they bolt also from the other side. In Israel, there's an expression, There's one thing to be bold on one side, but now you're bold on both sides. What does it mean? Could be that some people get bold in the forehead in the beginning, but they still have full hair in the back. Some people get bold in the back, but they still have a full blorit in the front. But some people have in the front and in the back. And eventually they merge together. But that's not what it means. It means sometimes people have hair in one side. They grow, they grow it very long and they cover the boldness, like Netanyahu. He takes his hair like this. If you see him after the shower, he's completely bald. But they do it in such a way with spray every time he comes before the media, and it looks like already he's 60 years old and still have hair. But he's bald already 20 years. But it's a very nice way to do it. A normal person doesn't have the time to start doing spray every day with makeup, putting spray underneath that they don't see the, the blind, you know. They don't have this time. But he, before he comes, you know, he comes to meet Obi in Washington, which he forgot when it happened already in his previous life, maybe. But finally, it's, that's why they say in Israel, now you bought from both sides. You don't have where to take from. You understand? That's what it means. Your bluff came out. That's what it really means. So the rich people, not only they don't have a next world, these stingy people that they did not tzedakah with their money, they didn't have this world also, because they're constantly stingy and cheap, all the times fighting with the wife, with the children, with the brothers, with the competition in the business. So, what for? To gain more. No, what are you going to do in the end? One day he died, all the money stay over here. Finished. What happened to all the miserable Jews in Europe before the Holocaust? One day they took them out of their homes, they put them in concentration camps, they didn't have access to their bank. They couldn't enter the bank. Jew cannot enter the bank. You have a hundred million dollar cash in a bank and you cannot enter the bank. They took it away. After 40 years of saving, you were a big businessman, factories, everything. Everything is gone in a minute. And the ones that hid money in Switzerland, doesn't even have identity on it. It used to go by numbers. The Swiss government stole all the money, the banks, the Swiss banks. If you remember, 15 years ago, there was a big trial here in New York against the Swiss bank. In the end, they threw $100 million to the survivors to sh shut their mouth completely when it should have been $100 billion. But they just gave $100 million settlement. Each one of them got a few thousand dollars, and, they, <laughs> and that was the end of it. But here it is. Let's see what this Tehillim has to teach the stingy rich people. Not all rich people are stingy. Some are very generous. There are people who give a lot, and Hashem send them tons of money more and more and more, and they give a lot, Baruch Hashem, the way it should be. This is not talking about the generous one. It's talking about the stingy one. 
למנצח לבני קורח מזמור, שמעו זאת כל העמים. The children of Korach wrote it. I told you their father was the richest guy in the world. So they know exactly what wealth is. Shimu zot kol amim. Listen, all the nations. Azinu kol yoshve Khaled. Listen carefully from close all the people of Khaled. People that are equal to Khulda, to a big rat that constantly wants to save more and more and more. Gam bnei adam, gam bnei ish. All the ordinary people, all the important people, yachad, together, everyone should listen. Who? Ashir ve'evyon, rich and poor. Why poor? Rich, we understand, he is referring to the rich people. Why is calling to the poor people also to listen? Some poor sometimes become rich. Listen now, if one day you be rich, don't forget his message. Pi edaber chokhmot, my mouth speaking words of wisdom. Ve'agut libit vunot, an intelligent thing comes from my heart. Atele mashal ozni, I am going to listen to this parable with my ear. Eftach bekinor chidati. I will open my secret with a violin. Why should I be scared in time of trouble, in days of tragedy? The sin, the intentional sin of Akevai Yesubeni, mitzvot that I did not consider to be important enough and I did not pay enough attention. I, I treated them cheaply. They are now coming to take revenge against me. I didn't pray seriously. I didn't, you know, I didn't care about all kinds of things that I used to do wrong. Now it's time to pay for it. Abotchim al chelam, those who trust their wealth, uvrov oshram italalu, bragging about their positions and homes and cars and clothes and watches. And you know, I'm the boss here. Ach lo padoif deish. Wealth cannot redeem anyone from Hashem. Nothing can help you if Hashem starts with you. Lo iten le'elokim kofro. Kofer means ransom. There is no amount that can redeem you from the hand of God. When he decides to give you what you deserve for all the stinginess years and all the sins, you will offer a billion dollars in cash for one tiny sin. It won't be enough. This is the words of him. They won't be able to redeem their soul. And they will be destroyed for eternity. Le'olam means for eternity. If a person would even live forever, he will never, even a person that, if a person, hypothetically speaking, was able to live forever and never see death, never. When he see smart people dying, yachad kisilu va'ar yovedu, just like the fool are dying, the smart are dying, ve'azvu la'acherim chelam, and then in the end, other people take away all their wealth. Kirbam batemu le'olam, inside their heart, they think that their homes would remain forever. Mishkenotam le'dor v'ador, this house will stay here thousands of years. Yeah, right. How many houses standing thousands of years? Karu bishmotam ale adamot. They are making sure that their names will be everywhere, all over the world. You know, they give a little donation, put my name on a wall, put my name here in the library, donation of this, on our own Kodesh, everything. This was donated by this family, this by this gen generous, this 
Make sure that their names is everywhere. I want you to call them in the streets after me. I'll give the CD donation. I want you to call the police department after me. I'll give you that. All this nonsense that we see everywhere with the rich people. Ve'adam bi'ikar bal yalin. But a person forget that this glory is temporary and fake, and you will not sleep there forever with the honor that you're getting. It will run away from you. Nimshalka be'emot nidmu. It's like the animals. An animal is dumb. What an animal understands? Future calculation. You, you don't understand that you behave like an animal, like a cow, like a pig. You don't get it? Zedarkam kesel amo. This is the way of the foolish people. Ve'achrem befiem irtzu sela. They also want their children after them to continue with this nonsense. Like sheep goes to slaughtering homes. That's how they will go eventually to the death. And it come from uh, control. They will imshelu baem, rodu, radu. It's controlling with strong hand. Yesharim la boker. Vetsuam, in a time of salvation, nobody will be able to get saved from his wealth. Who will be in charge? The tzaddikim, the righteous people. Whether he have a hundred dollars in his bank account, whether he has a hundred million dollars, the tzaddik, it doesn't matter. Even if you have no money, even if you have no bank account, you have twenty dollars in his pocket, very, very poor. When the salvation would come, you can have a hundred billion dollars, you are nothing. He's righteous, he's he's the king of the land. That's what he writes here. Vetsuram levalot sheol mizvulo. Vetsuram, all your strength will be rotten like Sheol, like hell. It's a place in Gehenom. There are seven different places. One of them called Sheol. Big fire over there, burning the wicked people with no mercy. Mizvulo. What is this Zvul? Zvul comes from like Zvulun, like wealth, like sponsor. Zvulun. Zvul also means home. Home. From his home, from his, uh, from his bunker. Bunker that they feel so safe inside. You know, there was a, this rich Syrian uh, banker, Safra, in Monte Carlo. He built himself a very nice home. One day, the poor man had a fire over there. And the police and the fire department came to save him. And he got locked into his bunker. And nobody knew the codes, how to enter in with all the security around him. Because one was the richest people in the world. So he protected himself with such security. Unfortunately, in a world like today, if you have some money, you're always a target of the, of the thieves. So the security that he made for himself, that's what killed him. If he didn't have all the security in two minutes, they'd save him. They just published Forbes magazine, the list of the richest Arab people in the world. First one is a Sultan, is the famous Sultan. Second one, his brother, Safra, the one that passed away. They were all brothers. The brother, they, they put his name as the second Arab billionaire in the world. He's a Jew. <laughs> yes. But they put him in a list with all the Arabs, believe it or not. Why? Because he came from Lebanon. Originally, they're Lebanese. They're not Syrian. They're Lebanese. That's what it says in the article. So after the Sheikh, one Jew. The only difference is, how many Jews live in the Arab countries? Maybe three million, five million, eh, peanuts. How many Arabs? Billion and a half. Billion and a half and five million, more or less in the same league. <laughs> Hard to believe, right? But that's nonsense, it's true. The question is, what do you leave in this world? What do you do with the money? You donate, beautiful. You don't, you have a serious problem. So it says like this. Ach Elokim if den afshim yat sheol. I know that Hashem will redeem and save my soul from this place in Sheol, in Gehenom. Ki kacheni sela. He would lead me to a place of eternity. Sela means forever. 
for eternity. Not Sela with Ain. Sela with Ain means rock. Sela with He means forever. Remember this. Al Tira, Al Tira, we almost finished. Al Tira, don't fear. Ki Ashir Ish, Ki Irbek Vod Beto. Don't fear when a person become rich, even when he has lots of real estate. Ki lo bemoto ikach hakol, velo yered acharav kvodo. Nobody can take anything with him in his death. Nothing will follow him to the grave. Ki nafsho bechayav yevarech, because only when he's alive he can still save his soul and bless it. And the, when you come to the next world, they will praise you and look at you positively for doing good for your soul. When a person dies, he will join to his father if he was stingy like his father, rich and stingy like the father was, he will join him in the same place in Gehenom. Ad netzach lo yiruor. For eternity, they will never see the light of Hashem. What a horrible thing. You have a person that listens to it tomorrow on the internet, and he knows I am the rich one that this Tehillim speak. Not me, I'm only reading. Reading and translating. It's nothing me, I didn't write Tehillim. You have complaints, don't send it to me. Send it. www.askgod.com. Ask him. Why is so angry about wealthy people that are stingy? Why they never see in the next world heaven? Never see the light of God? Why? Okay, I was stingy. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I was just stingy. Stingy means you don't trust me. I gave you so much, you still don't trust me. You have everything for yourself. You see other Jews dying. They don't know what Torah is. How many times you heard the rabbis begging you donate money for the CDs? Why for every thousand people that listen to it, only one send money for CDs? Why? Where is all the others? So you say half of them are poor. Okay, they don't have. Fine, they don't have. Don't have, you don't have. But the other ones does have. Why they don't send? Why they don't send? They send for donuts for Hanukkah. For that they send. Oh, there's a beautiful shul, $12 million. They want their name on a, on a wall. For that, they'll send a the million dollars, no problem. But why not to save the souls of Miskenim? I remember I told you about two months ago, right here, there's not one hour that I don't get at least one email from a Baal Tshuva from my lecture somewhere in the world. Now I want to correct my words. Minimum two per hour now. Minimum two per hour. You do the math, it's almost 50 a day. That's what I get. I don't hear about all of them. It's a minority, they, they send me emails. I have a list of few people that I send them copy of these emails. If there's private information, I take it off, because it's not their business. But when they talk about how they became religious from the lecture, this part, I send it to these people to educate them, to see. Some of them, they have tears when they read it. Today I got an email from Muhammad, an Arab. Would you give me permission to come to your lecture? He wrote, you should see what a nice letter he wrote. Why? The power of the Torah. The power of the Torah. All you have to know is to present it correctly and the way Hashem really wrote it. Don't modify it. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't hide parts from it original, the way Hashem wrote it in the Torah, that's how you must teach it. People bark against you, you should care less about them. Like I read once the words of the Rambam. The Rambam say, you remember that I told you that or no? In case you forgot, I'll read it to you from inside the book. The Rambam says, I will not find any other advice to teach the truth of Hashem, that was proven, that will fit to one superb person. Ten thousand people would complain, one would like what I said. 
One Jew would like the ethic and the musar that I would say to him, Rambam say. 10,000 will say, scary, fanatic, too much. It's not our way. Darkea, darke noam, and the rest of their nonsense. The Rambam say, Areni ma'adif le'omro bishvil ha'echad. I prefer to say it for the one. Velo achush. I will, I can care less about the complaints about the 10,000. They can bark until tomorrow, what do I care? The one that search for the truth, appreciate it, it's worth it. It's worth it for the one, but 10,000 will go far away. They say it's too strict. God is too strict. The punishments are too much. I don't want to have any part with this. What is it, my business? I didn't write the Torah. My job is only to present the wish of God. Why he made it strict is not my problem. He never consulted with me. I did not sit in a committee when he asked my opinion, should I make it strict or should I make it easy? My job is to present it as it is, not to move it 1% left or right. The punishment of those who modify the Torah, words cannot describe, even if they call themselves rabbis. Words cannot describe all these phony ones who give lectures about jokes and about Hollywood and about all kinds of nonsense. And in 20 years they speak in a shul and not one time they told their community the right way to behave according to the Torah. The ladies continue to come half naked. The men continue to talk in a tefillah. Half of the people continue to use drug on a daily basis. The other half continue to go to the casino and lose all their money and destroy their family. Half of the people come to the, car, to the shul with a car. Half of their children are on the street. People are lost. People are merry going. People are destroyed. And he sits with his belly on his chair on the Mizrach and nothing worry him as long as he gets his salary and everything is fine. And how does he reserve his place? By not saying what Hashem wants him to say, because if he will say it, they get angry, they'll fire him, he's worried. So he continue with his nonsense, and one day he dies and he comes in front of Hashem, and Hashem say, which Torah you represented? So yours, Hashem, ma. We, I went to Yeshiva, ma. Which Torah I taught? I read from the Torah. I'm sorry, you did not read half of my Torah. You only read half that you chose. What about the other half? I gave it together. Why you didn't say about this? I was afraid to scare the people. That's not your call. That's my call, not yours. I knew that there would be people who run away from it when he hear that Michalel Shabbat is a goy. Didn't I know it? But I still wrote it 12 times in the Torah. I knew that people would go crazy when they see what's going to be their end. But I wanted them to know it. Otherwise, I would put it in Kabbalah. I wouldn't write it in a Torah for every kid to read it. If I did not want all Jews to know it, only the superb, extra special ones, I would give it in a Midrash, in a Gemara, in a Zohar, places that not all Jews visiting. If I wrote it in my Chumash, which is in first grade, in every school, first grade, they learn Chumash, and they read these things in a Chumash. That means I wanted every little kid to know what will be his end if he will betray me and if he will go against my rules. So what made you a second God to overrule my decision? Where are they going to hide in a judgment day? As once, okay, you don't have the guts to say the truth of God. No. I cannot say that you do the right thing. Obviously, you're not. But I, I can at least understand why you're afraid to say the truth. Because you see how the people react. And you deal with phony people, and you're afraid to tell them the truth. I can understand at least where it comes. Now that it's the right thing, but I understand at least the pressure, the politics behind the scene. I understand. But one thing I don't understand, when there's finally two or three in the world that does have the courage to say the truth, why you don't run to support them? Why you go against them from behind their back? That's where I'm going to test you on. You come and say, I, I knew I had to say it, but I didn't have the guts. So Hashem will say to him, but why when the other person did have the guts, 
and people were spitting in his face and going crazy, why you did not support him? Why you didn't help him from behind? Why not only you didn't help, you ran also against him with all the wicked people? Why you publish all kinds of things to people that their understanding is that you're actually supporting the gays, the lesbians, and the mechalelei Shabbat? Why? Where is your fear for me? You choose these losers against someone who gives his life to present my Torah? Where are they going to hide then? That's the question that it's open. It will be answered when Mashiach comes. And if you think that I'm referring to myself, you are wrong, because I do not even say 20% of the truth. If I was more brave, I would have to say it a lot louder and more with details. But I myself is afraid. There are only few in the world that are saying the whole truth. You don't hear them, never. You hear them in only few good yeshivot, that's it. It doesn't come to the public. The real truth of the Torah, it's very rarely to hear in public today. Some places you don't hear anything. 20 years, the same thing, nothing, no progress, nobody. Some make progress. They say 20, 30, 50% of the truth. But the real ones, I say once to my cousin, I want to send somebody from Torah anytime in Jerusalem to record your Musar talks. He said to me, no, don't send. I say, why? You give Musar the things that the Gaon Mivil wrote 250 years ago. It's amazing, amazing Musar. He said, nobody can handle it. People cannot handle the truth. Better not to say. That's what his answer was. I said, well, but there are others. Say, better not to start dealing with this headache. One person would like it, 10,000 will begin to fight you. Let me learn Torah. I don't want headache. It's not his job. He's not a public speaker. He learns in yeshiva. He doesn't want his Torah to spread to the losers out there. Why? He knows what's going to happen. They won't let him learn. They start attacking him nonstop, coming. Where do you say that? Where does it say this? Prove this to me. All the ignorant people, they won't give him a rest. He doesn't want a headache. He wants to sit and learn and, and do what he wants to do, not to finally start arguing with half of the world. So the Rambam concludes his words, i rather say it for the one. I can care less for the public. I focus on saving the soul of that one that was locked in ignorance around him until I will bring him to perfectness because we, we prefer the one intelligent, wise Jew that search for the truth would follow us one, one, even if 10,000 fools will run away and one would come closer, we prefer that than nothing, than not to say. One you save, 10,000 ran away. No, what do you say about this? If I would say it, people would say, you're crazy. Where do you get this nonsense from? But Baruch Hashem is the greatest rabbi in the last thousand years wrote it. The biggest in the whole world. One of the biggest in history. Even the Goim put his statue in Washington as one of the 18 greatest people ever lived. Maimonides, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, the greatest posek in Jewish history. The Rambam, the biggest philosopher, a great doctor, a huge astronomer, a mathematician, the right-hand man of the king of Egypt. What else do you want? And he wrote it, and he knew all the Torah, he knew all the Gemara, he knew all the Mishnah, he knew everything word by word. And he lived 850 years ago, not today. Everything was pure back then. And he wrote it, save the one, don't worry about the 10,000. Why? We're not going for quantity, we're going for quality. Someone that deserves to get saved, we will save him. Someone that doesn't want to follow the truth, it's his problem, not mine. Doctor must say the truth to his patient, whether he like it, whether he will take the medicine, whether he will go to the, to the x-ray or to the surgery, or whether he will not go. That's not the doctor's problem. The doctor writes in his file, I inform the patients that he has three months to live if he won't go directly into special treatment. I inform the patient. The patient wants to die, it's not my problem. 
The patient will complain against me that I'm a strict doctor. What is it my problem? I must do my job. If I begin to give him compliments and candy, you're good, I cannot be a doctor anymore. So it says like this. We finish the last sentence of this mismoor. People like this that wants everything to reserve for themselves like animals. This is how they go chas v'shalom to Gehenom, to hell, and will never come out of there and will never see the light of Hashem for eternity. What are they lost? What are they lost for hiding his millions for 10, 20 years? Adam Bikar velo yavin. A person is deep in honor and kavod. He wants glory, kavod. He's so deep into this nonsense. Velo yavin. He doesn't understand that he's like an animal in the eyes of Hashem. Here, Teilim, Teilim, chapter 49. A person doesn't understand that this behaving, it's like the rat. The rat that comes and steal and run and put it and come again and steal. And all the, uh, but either, the rat will not use 1% of what he saves. Who does the rat save all this for? Who? Same thing, the ant. The ant lives six months. The life of the ant, one and a half pieces of bread, it's enough for the ant for the whole life. One and a half grams. One and a half gram. Do you know what's one and a half gram? Tiny gram from your cookie fell. Two pieces like this. It's the food of the end for the entire life. One hour or two hours, it takes to the end to get it from on the floor in your house to the corner where they hide. Two hours they work. They have enough food for the whole life. But what do they do all day? Collecting and collecting and collecting. That's what Shlomo HaMelech say. There's one thing you can learn from the end. What? It never rests. The same way the end collecting food, you collect Torah and mitzvot. Non-stop, there's never enough. Never enough. Bezrat Hashem, we'll see you next, uh, next Wednesday. Thank you for coming. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.